Okay, so understood the importance of reading the MRI films. Okay. Whatever you are seeing the patient, whatever you see the patient clinically, whatever you examine, you make a clinical diagnosis, you send the patient for MRI, patient comes back to you with the MRI films. In the report, there are multiple things which are mentioned, but you have to find out the cause of this pain, whatever you have seen clinically, and you have to correlate it clinically with the patient findings. Okay, And based on that, now you are deciding the intervention. Okay. Most of the time, like uh, in uh, at IPSC, what we normally do is uh, we don't do any intervention without MRI. This may be a problem in some of the government institutes where the MRI may not be possible for every patient, but wherever possible, if you are if you are in a in a private institute. In a private setup, you must go for the MRI before going for any intervention. I'll show you in the MRIs, when we discuss about the MRIs, that time we'll, I'll show you. There are multiple pathologies, multiple pathologies, which may not be visible on the CT scan or the X-rays, but which are much very much relevant to your clinical practice. Okay. Even for the joints, I don't do anything without MRI. Until I don't have the MRI, I don't proceed with the intervention. The most important reason is that clinically what we are seeing, okay, and when we get an MRI of the joint or the spine, there is there are conditions which are actually contradictions for the interventions also. Right? There are some contradictions for the interventions. Now, to rule out those contradictions also, we need to go for the MRI. Even if your clinical finding is exactly what, what is matching with the, your diagnosis, even if you're sure about a clinical diagnosis, still we should go for the MRI because to rule out, at times, we have to go for the MRI to rule out any contradiction for your intervention. The most important is what? The most important is infection, infection. right? Okay. So as we know that tuberculosis of the spine is not that uncommon, okay? Or metastasis to the spine is not that uncommon. uncommon. So we have to rule out those contradictions also okay although metastasis is not a contradiction but you may find something else whatever your clinical finding is you may find something else okay so that is why it is always better to go and see the mri films never ever see the mri reports before you examine the patient before you examine the mri films otherwise what will happen when you see the MRI films, MRI reports, before even examining the patient or examining the MRI films, you are biased. Now in your mind, something else is there because you already read the report, which is mentioning maybe some multiple things. Okay. So it is always better not to see the reports. Okay. Examine the patient properly. Take a proper history. Examine the patient. Okay. If the patient is already having MRI, see the MRI films, make a diagnosis. And then you can go for the, at last you may go for the MRI reports, just to see that you are not miss anything. Okay, understood? Yes. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> so the first investigation of is is what normally what we usually um, send a patient for 
is the exterior of the spine, right? So exterior of the spine, what we all we can what all we can see on the X-ray, the spondylitis, spondylitic changes, spondylolysis, spondylolysis, or if there is any fracture. So what is spondylitis? Anyone? Inflammation of the. Anyone else? Any symmetry changes in the uh, vertebra? Okay. Anybody wants to contribute more? So spondylitis is not, though it is itis, it's not an inflammation. Spondylitis is like osteoarthritis. Is osteoarthritis a inflammatory condition, purely inflammatory condition? Degenerative. Degenerative, correct. Similarly, of the spine, spondylitis means it's a degenerative condition of the spine. It's a radiological diagnosis. It's not a clinical diagnosis, it's a radiological diagnosis. So whenever we see some osteophytes or some sclerosis, Okay, or some DNA changes in the facet joints, then we call it as a spondylitis. Most commonly, people use this term spondylitis, cervical spondylitis. I am having spondylitis, right? Okay, so you cannot just pain is not a reason for spondylitis. Okay, so spondylitis is a DNA condition of the spine. When we see on the X-ray some DRD changes of the spine, then we call it a spondylitis. What is spondylolysis? Lysis means what? Breakage? Breakage or fracture of the spine. Fracture of the... What part of the spine? Uh, the articular surface? Uh, not the articular surface. It's basically the Pars interarticularis. Okay. Now, I think uh, you must have gone through this uh, in, uh, the um, anatomy of the spine. Yes. Anna? In that we have pars interarticularis, which, yes. Yes. which is a junction between the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment. Yes. Right? Yeah. Between the superior article process and inferior article process. Mm -hmm. There's a pars interarticularis. And when we see the, in the oblique way, when we see that, Neck of the Scotty dog is a pars interarticularis. Mm -hmm. So if there's a breakage in that or defect in the pars interarticularis, then we call it a spondylolysis. Okay. What is spondylolysis? That is uh, one vertebral body, uh, you know, slips over the other vertebral body. body. Yeah. Yes. So this happens whenever we have the spondylolysis on both the sides. Mm -hmm. Now these anti compartment, posterior compartment are separate. And in that case, we may get this kind of spondylolisthesis. Okay. And fracture, so we know all fractures. So I think uh, your radiological evolution of the spine, uh, sorry, uh, the philosophy of anatomy is covered in the last class. Yeah. Okay. So you know all the structures. What is that? That is the, the pedicle. Pedicle. Right? The pedicle. The vertical body. The yeah. pedicle other side. The transfer process. The superior plate, inferior plate, the spinous process. Okay. And the very faint shadow over here is the what is that? Yes, that's a lamina. Yeah. Okay. So that's a lamina. Headband. This is a super lamina over here. And this is the interlaminar space over here. Right? This is the interlaminar inter space. And that's the interspinal space over here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> In the lateral view, we can see this vertical body over here. We can see the pedicle over here. What is this? Shadow. 
transfer process. Superior article process. No, that is a transfer process. Yeah. Very superior to an article process in this. Superior article process. Okay. Yeah. Starting from here to here is the superior article process. SAP. Okay. This entire is a superior article process. Okay. And behind that is the inferior article process. And that's from the facet joint over here. Okay. And that's the yeah. parts of the foramen. We already discussed in the anatomy. The parts of the foramen. The superior part and the inferior part. This okay. is the intervertebral foramen. So what all we can see on the x-rays? Suppose if you have a patient who comes to you with the x-ray, okay, and if you have finding like this, so can you see something here? This is the intervertebral space. Yeah. We can't see the disc, right? We can't see the disc on the x-ray. Yeah. We yeah. can see only the bones. Yes. Okay. But what we see here is the intervertebral space. We can see the the end plates. Okay, but look at this. What is happening over here? The space is reduced. The space the reduction is reduced. Of space. Perfect. And what else? The margins appear that chipped off or uh, lipping is. Seen. So margins are basically you can see there's an osteophyte here. That's okay. true. You know? But here you can see the sclerosis. These are sclerotic end plates. And also you can see in the disc space, we have a dark yes. line over here. Okay. That's a basically called a vacuum phenomena. That's a nitrogen gas which gets accumulated because of the severe degeneration of the disc. So when the disc starts degenerating, it starts liberating some gases and the end plates are sclerosed and of sclerosis, there is hard, hardly any movement happening here and this gas starts accumulating inside the disc and forms a called a vacuum phenomena. So nitrogen gas starts accumulating inside the disc. So this is a sign of what? This is a sign of secret degeneration of the disc or the desiccation of the disc. Okay. Now if you look at these end plates, the end plates are really very important. If if you have X-ray, we can make out from looking at the end plates that is there is something grossly wrong happening inside, or it's a normal process. Now, if you look at these end plates, these are looking healthy. There is no breach in the end plates. Okay, but if you look at these end plates, can you see some depression over here? Yes. Yeah. You can see the depressions over here, right? Yes, yes. But these kind of depressions are the normal variations or these are called small snores. These may yeah. not be pathological. These may not be pathological. This may not cause any pain. Why? We can say that because if you look at this end plates, these are smooth. There's no erosion over here. That means it's just a depression which is happening in the end plates, but there's no erosion happening over here. So most probably there is no pathologies over here. So but what is it called? It's SMORLS small snorts. Okay. Small snorts, yeah. But if you look at this end plate over here, this is looking fine. But if you look at this end plate, we can see some erosion is happening over here. Now if you have an X-ray, patient comes to you with a back pain. And if you see such kind of end plate erosions, now there are multiple causes of that. This may be a significant finding inside. Okay. Now this kind of erosions may be a sequel of severe degeneration of the disc, which may cause erosion of these end plates. This could be some infective cause also, maybe pot spine, mm -hmm. or maybe because of some metastasis which is happening over here. Okay, so in such cases, yeah. if you see such erosion of the end plates, in that case, you should not make any diagnosis with the X-ray. We have to send the patient for the MRI. Okay, because this could be a something seriously serious happening inside. Okay, <clears throat> on X-ray, we can make out about the. Pars intertipularis defect, 
or the facet arthropathies. If you're suspecting clinically, if you're suspecting past intraticular defect, or if you're suspecting facet arthropathy, and you have to send a patient for the X-ray, don't just write down X-ray LS spine AP lateral. You may not find anything. Okay, so you have to specify whatever you are suspecting. You have to specify what you want, what you want to see. You have to specify that, right? So whenever you are suspecting past defect, or if you are suspecting facet arthropathy, and you have to send a patient for the X-ray, <clears throat> order the oblique X-ray. Mm -hmm. Mention to your investigation that we need. Oblique, right oblique, or left oblique x ray. And mention in a diagnosis, deficient diagnosis, that you are suspecting far intertude defect. So, some information from your side is important for the radiologist to, to take a, those sections also. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> yeah. If you're suspecting on the right side or the left side, you have to say right oblique or left oblique, whatever you want. Okay. So if you look at this, <clears throat> if you look at this, can you see this? Pass intraticular, see over here? Yeah. Hmm? Why it is called yes. intraticular? Is? Between two articular process. Between two between superior article process and inferior article process, this junction is called a pars intraticularis. Okay, so this is intact over here, this is intact over here, but here you can see there's a breach in the pars intraticularis. So this is a diagnosis of spondylolysis. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So lot of time, your facet arthropathy, when you're suspecting facet arthropathy, and a past defect, clinically they present to you in a similar fashion. These are the patients who may come to you that I am having pain whenever I do some twisting movements. Whenever I get up out of the chair, suddenly I get a catch over there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I am sitting in my car, I am coming out of my car, that time I get this pain. Okay. So this may happen with the facet arthropathy also, this may happen with the past defect also. So if you are suspecting any of these two, you must order oblique X-ray, not the AP lateral. Okay. You don't need AP lateral at all in this. Along with that, you need. You can you can always say AP lateral and oblique. Yeah. Like like when we go for this spondylolisthesis, yeah. right? For the spondylolisthesis, similarly, whenever we order spondylolisthesis, when you are suspecting spondylolisthesis, so when do you suspect spondylolisthesis? Yeah. When the patient comes to you and patient says that I'm having back pain, which may be less, back pain may be less, but they typically they complain soft. When I start walking, after walking certain distance, I start getting numbness in my leg or heaviness in my legs. Right? That is a symptom of what? Spinal stenosis. Yes. Okay, so if you are suspecting such pass, it's a spondylolisthesis, and you have to send the patient for the X-ray. Again, remember, don't just write down AP lateral X-ray. Okay, what is important here? When is this getting slipped? When it is getting compressed? When there's a movement, no flexion. When there's a movement, when there's a pressure. Yeah. When there's a pressure. If the patient is sitting idle, patient with the support, or the patient is lying down, there is no compression of the nerves. Why? Because maybe the vertebras are there in a the normal position. They are not sliding. But when they start walking, when they put a pressure on the spine, that is the time when the, they start slipping and they start compressing the nerves. Okay. So what will you, how will you find out that? Flexion extension, extension. Flexion extension is for the for the different reason. But what is more important here is that you have to order a standing X-ray. Okay. 
standing X-ray. Yes. Don't just write down AP uh, X-ray spine, L spine, AP lateral. If they if they if they come to you with the with the supine position, take a AP X-ray and a lateral X-ray. In a supine position, you may miss your diagnosis. So mention in your X-ray that you want X-ray L spine standing. Now AP lateral. Along with that, now you want to see whether it is a stable listesis or if it is a unstable listesis. Okay, because your management will change if it is stable or if it is unstable. In that case, you have to go for the flexion and extension of the X ray of the L spine. I'm sorry, the standing X ray, L spine, flexion and extension. Okay, if the grade is changing with flexion extension, that means it's an unstable listesis. And that becomes a candidate for surgical fixation. All right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> X-rays of the SI joint. X-rays of the SI joint, sacral leg joint, sacral lattice. Normally, the biggest mistake what people do is that whenever, even if you have good suspicion of ankylosing spondylitis, ang spond, what is the first thing which comes to your mind with ankylosing spondylitis? Fusing of spine. Fusion. Bamboo appearance. Bamboo, bamboo spine, yes, bamboo appearance. Fusion of the joints. And uh, curvatures uh, are straightened. Straightened or it, it may become more kyphotic. Not yeah. straightened, it becomes kyphotic. Gradually it becomes kyphotic. Okay? Not straightened. <clears throat> so if you are suspecting a spondyloarthropathy or the ankle spondylitis, and if you see normal X-ray, you don't see any fusion, you don't see any bamboo spine. So can you rule out with that? With the normal X-rays? The joints also have to be seen. Huh? What? The adjacent joints. Adjacent joints, okay. Let's say adjacent joints. But, so facet joints are also not yeah. fused. Bilateral SI joint in normal yeah. Bilateral SI joint involvement, suppose let's say bilateral SI joint involvement is there in this patient. Patient is having bilateral SI joint tenderness is also there. Patient is having a lot of stiffness in the morning. <clears throat> bilateral pain is there. So remember one thing. Whatever we know about ankylosing spondylitis, that fusion of the joints, fusion of the spine, bamboo spine, kyphotic spine, these are all late features of the ankylosing spondylitis. These are very late features of ankylosing spondylitis. When you can detect them on the X-rays. But what happens in the early stages? What is the feature in the early uh, stages of this ankylosing spondylitis? Inflammations. Yes, perfect. Good. Inflammation of the joints. It starts with the inflammation of the joints. Can you see this inflammation on the X-ray? The SI joint, yes. actually the surface is not uh, even. Uh, I think there is some disruption. I don't know. I can't make out what exa how exactly a disruption, but it doesn't look normal on the... Uh, no, no, we'll, we'll discuss this later. <clears throat> but what I'm asking is, <clears throat> can we see inflammation on X-ray? Uh, irregular joint lines are suggestive of uh, inflammation. Again, irregularity will come later. <clears throat> Probably MRI. So, <clears throat> whenever you're suspecting any inflammatory pathology, what I'm trying to tell you is that whenever you're suspecting any inflammatory pathology, spondyl arthropathy, X-ray is not a choice. Okay. Okay. Though you have very typical features on X-ray, but all these features are the late features of spinal arthropathies, not the early features. 
Okay. Okay. And this is one of the biggest mistake people do. They have a strong suspicion of the inguinal spondylitis, post arthropathy. They order X-ray of the spine or the. If, they, if you get an X-ray of the L spine or the SI joints, and if they're normal, we rule out spondylarthropathy, <clears throat> which is not correct. Okay. So whenever you suspect any inflammatory pathology, you have to go for the MRI. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. So here, what we are seeing here is the you can see this is maybe the normal finding, the early stages of the ankle spondylitis. Now, <clears throat> the inflammatory process is getting healed by how the bones get healed by sclerosis. Sclerosis. Okay. So that's why you can see the margins. Sclerosis. You can see some bright margins over here. Okay. So these are the bright margins which are showing the sclerotic joints. Okay. Here you can see the erosions also. A lot of erosions over here. And it has already started fusing. And this one is complete fusion which has taken place. You can see this completely fused. And also you can see the ligaments over here. They are also getting calcified. Ankylosed. Okay, so these are the late features of the angular spondylitis for any inflammatory arthropathies. Not just angular spondylitis, for any inflammatory condition, all these erosions, fusion are the late features. Okay, so don't just rule out based on the x rays. What else we can see on the x ray? There's something called, I think, in the last, in the Anatomy lecture, we discussed about the circulation and numeration. Yeah, traditional vertebrae. Okay, transition vertebrae. Yes, right? sorry, transition. transition vertebrae, they may cause pain also. Yes. Although that is not the major source of the pain, it is a normal variations. But at times, this may become a source of the pain. Okay, so how we can see that on x rays? Now, if you look at this transition vertebrae here, this S1 is lumberized. Yeah. S1 is lumberized. You can see the transfer process over here, and they are free transfer process. They are not fusing with any bone, surrounding bone. Yes. Okay. So these kind of findings, this this kind of finding may not cause any pain. This is just a normal variation. Mm. But if you look at this other side. You can see here the transfer process, uh, they, they grown and they are forming the joints over here with the sacrum or the ilium. Okay, this may be a source of the pain because now they are joining and forming a pseudo joint with the surrounding bone. This may be sacrum or the ilium. This may become a source of pain. This may go goes into degeneration. Because why I'm saying these are pseudo joints? Because there is no articular surface here. There is no capsule over here. They don't have articular surfaces. They don't have any capsule. So that's why these joints, pseudo joints, may go into degeneration very fast. Okay, and this can become a source of the pain, although rare, but you must keep this in mind. Okay, so look at this. This is a normal variation. Both the transfer process are free here. Okay, here you can see this forming a pseudo joint with the ilium over here. Right, this side if you look at here, forming a pseudo joint with the sac with the sacrum. Now this one, if you look at here, can you see that? It is completely fused now. Now again, mm -hmm. this kind of 
fusion will not cause any pain because there is no pseudo joint formation. It's, it's already fused. It is already fused with the bone. So there is no movement happening over here. There is no pseudo joint over here. So again, this kind of fusion may not cause any pain. Okay. Sir, but, does it also okay. restrict the movements because it's causing pseudo joints? So pseudo joints may cause restriction of the joint also, especially the twisting movements. Okay. May not be fraction extension, but twisting movements may cause this kind of pain. So and they fact, must only come with the pain, not any restriction of movements. No, no, with not not with the restrictions. In most of the normal variants, these are normal variants. Even if it is lumbarized or sacralized, you may not have any restriction of the movements. Okay. Yeah. So even after this fusion, although this is this variation may not cause any pain, but at times what happens because there should be some movement happening over here, but this movement is not happening. So which joint is taking the load? The upper joints. Okay. So these are the joints which may go into early degeneration in such patients. Understood? So this may be another source of the pain in these patients. CT scan, not much of use for our uh, practice. But yes, whenever there's a acute trauma, some if you are suspecting some posterior cortical defects, when we plan for the vertiplasties, if you have a posterior cortical defect or the destruction, in that case, we have to rule out the posterior cortical, uh, any chip coming into the spinal canal. In those cases, we can go for the CT scan. When MRI is not uh, possible, in that case, we can go for the CT scan. For calcification of the ligaments, especially the in, longitudinal ligaments, a CT scan is a better choice. So whenever you are suspecting bony pathologies, yes, CT scan is a good choice. Especially if we are, if we have to do something in the vertebral body, especially when we go for the vertebral plasties, that time we do have a rule of CT scan. If you have a patient who comes with the metastasis in the spine and we are planning for the vertebral plasties, we have to rule out whether it is a osteogenetic kind of lesion or osteoblastic kind of lesion, then we go for the CT scan. If you are suspecting some posterior cortical involvement, in that case, we may go for the CT scan. Okay. <clears throat> on the CT scan, also what we can see on the X-rays, we can see here on the CT scan also. We can see a lot of sclerosis. We can see DNA changes, spondylitic changes over here. We can see the osteophytes formation over here. So all these things we can get it on the CT scan also. This is the vacuum phenomena we can see here. That's the vacuum phenomena which is happening inside the vertebral disc. Okay, you can see there's a big osteophyte over here. Spondylysis, if you are not very sure about the spondylysis, pass defect on the x-ray. At times it may not be possible for us to detect those. In that case, we can go for the CT scan. In the CT scan, it will be clearly visible. Vertical fracture, as I mentioned, because you only want to see the posterior cortical wall, or if there's a committed fracture, in those cases, we want to see the Fragment, whether it is encroaching into the spinal canal, in those cases, it is better to go for the CT scan. Because at times, what happens along with this fracture, you may have some disc condition also, and you are not sure on the MRI whether it is a bony fragment or some disc fragment. Okay, that will not be able to we may not be able to differentiate that on MRI. So for that, we have to go for the CT scan. Are you getting a point? Yeah. This is one of the uh, diagnostic uh, tool which was there for the discogenic kind of pain. Uh, not in much use nowadays. So this was earlier when we, uh, when this disc replacement surgery came, that time it was necessary to have a positive prosopocratic discography test for the disc replacement surgeries. But for most of our cases, when we do bicoplasties or the neuroplasties, in those cases, 
MRI is sufficient. Clinical finding and the MRI findings, they are sufficient. But still, still it is considered as a gold standard that you go inside the disc and you put contrast and see the leakage of the contrast and pressurize the disc and see the provocate the pain. If the patient complains of pain, that means it's a provocative discography, which is positive. <clears throat> okay. And also after that, injecting the contrast, after putting the pressure inside the disc, you can send this patient for the CT scan and you can see this tears over here. Now look at this, this is normal disc. So contrast is within the nucleus. Annulus is intact. Entire annulus is intact. Here you can see there's a small tear over here and the contrast is leaking through the tear. But the outer annulus is intact. Okay, this is a big tear over here. And you can see here, that's a big tear. So this, again, CT uh, discography we can do. Calcified ligament, as I mentioned that for the PLN and the ALL, at times, these calcifications may lead to the compression of the spinal cord. Patient may come to you with the, with the myelopathy features. And when you go for the CT scan, we can find these kind of longitudinal ligaments which are calcified. So we'll come to the MRI. MRI is a test of the choice for in a spine, <clears throat> but we have to see, as I mentioned earlier, that we may see multiple pathologies of the MRI. All may not be the sources of the pain. This is one of the good article. You can read this article. This will give you a lot of information about the MRIs. Okay. So this is this is a multicentric uh, study in that. They conducted a study on 3,000, more than how many? 3,110 asymptomatic patients. See this. They conducted MRI on 3,100 asymptomatic patients. Okay. And what we found in that is the disc degeneration was present in asymptomatic populations in 37% of the patients in the age of 20 years, at the age of 20 years, which increased to 40, at the age of 40, 68% of the patient, they had MRI findings of disc degeneration, but they had no history of any back pain. They're totally asymptomatic. So all the degenerative process, whatever is happening inside the body, may not be the source of the pain. Although you may see them on MRI, but that may not be the source of the pain. Okay, this you must keep in your mind. Everything, whatever you see on the MRI is not the source of the pain. Don't start treating MRIs. Okay, that's why again, again, I'm telling you, clinical correlation is most important. Clinical diagnosis and then MRI is a supporting document for your correlation. Okay. Based on that, you can go for the interventions, but not just based on the MRI findings. So this is the kind of MRI films we normally get, right? These kind of MRI films we get, where we see multiple right sections, multiple kind of uh, um, uh, images over here. Okay, all these have a lot of importance. Don't just look at the most of the MRIs. If you see, they'll give you one big picture of the L spine. Okay. On one side, you have a very big picture of the spine. Don't look at that picture. Never ever look at that picture. Okay. Understood this point. Have you seen those MRIs with the big spine picture on one side? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure everybody must have seen that. Yes. Yeah. So I'm telling you. It's 20 should, hours. That should be the last image you should be seeing. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you why. <clears throat> so these are the kind of images what we get. We get multiple plates with multiple images. All of them have a lot of significance. <clears throat> so 
So what is the role of MRI in L spine? One is as you pathology. pathologies, clinical correlation, and third is intervention. Deciding the intervention, right? So MRI will tell us the architecture of the disc, whether it is hydrated, whether it is desiccated. Okay, why it is important for us to know? Because our intervention will change with that. If it is a hydrated disc, there's some pathology in the disc, disc is bulging and it is hydrated, we may have a different intervention for that. But if you have a desiccated disc, this may not be the source of the pain. Although on MRI, the hydrated disc with a small pathology may be a big source of the pain, chronic pain, whereas a desiccated, horrible looking MRI, horrible looking disc may not be the source of the pain at all. Okay. Distribution of the end plates and the annulus. These are the areas, end plates and the annulus, they do have nerve supply. So any defect in the end plates or the annulus may be the source of the pain. Even it is a minor tear, minor end plate defect. This may be a source of the pain. Okay. Secondary changes. We have to see the secondary changes. What are happening? Suppose there is a disc degeneration. Along with that, we have end plates, superior inferior end plates. Okay. So what are changes are happening in the vertical bodies? Now, what type of changes are happening? Now, depending on the type of the changes, we'll don't worry, we'll discuss everything in detail. This I'm just giving the overview. Okay. Depending on the type of the changes, our management will change. Whether it is a type 1, type 2, type 3, we have different management for these three conditions. Okay. So that is why it is important for you to know what kind of body changes it is. What kind of pathology it is. What is the meaning of type 1? What is the meaning of type 2? What is the meaning of type 3? They may not write anything to you. They may be just give they may just give you some body changes happening in the body bodies. That's it. But what kind of body changes are happening? But which type of body changes are happening? That you have to see on the MRI. Because you have to perform the procedure. Okay. Herniation. What type of herniation it is? That is a contained herniation, annulus is intact or not. That it is extruded, whether it is sequestrated, if it is extruded or sequestrated, where it has migrated, which nerve it is involved, involving, which nerve it is compressing. And especially now we are going for the the intervention pain management has gone to the next higher level of definitive interventions like endoscopic dystrotomy. So when we do endoscopic dystrotomy, we must know where is the fragment lying. They will not tell you anything about that. They will just tell you that this is herniated and this is extruded. That's it. But you have to see that where is the herniation lying? Where, where, where is the approach? From where will you enter? How will you target that fragment? How will you take out that fragment? Okay. So for that, you have to read this, where it is extruded, it is migrated upwards, downwards, where it is locating, whether it is a central herniation, paracentral, or it is in the foramen, or it is gone outside the foramen. Because your approach will change according to that. Okay. You have to target a fragment. You have to target a nerve which is getting compressed. Okay. At times, this may also happen that Suppose if you are doing at L4, L5 level, there is a herniation at L4, L5 level, but L4 nerve is free, L5 nerve is free. In that case, you, neither your L4 is target nor L5 is target. Okay. Standing MRI for the listeners not mandatory, but if you have that facility, you can go for the standing MRI for the listeners. But for this, X-ray is sufficient. X-ray will tell you everything. Okay, what grade does it is? X-ray will tell you. But if you are going for the surgical intervention, we always go for the MRI because we want to see other pathologies. Whether we just want to fix, because now we do percutaneous fixation also. 
So if you don't have the MRI, whether we how will you come to know whether we need a decompression or not? With percutaneous fixation, you can do the fixation part, but you cannot do the decompression part. Okay, for that we know we must know the MRI. We must see the MRI whether we need decompression or not. If there is no compression, if there is no stenosis, if there is no hypertrophy of the flavum of the ligament or the uh, uh, facetal. Mm -hmm. In that case, we can go for the percutaneous fixation. We don't know how to go, how to go open the spine. We don't have to do, do, do a decompression. Okay. Canal stenosis. Now, what canal stenosis is there? Is it because of the disc? Is it because of the flavum? Is it because of the facetal? Is it because of some cyst? Is it because of listesis? Or it is because of some collection inside? So there are multiple sources of the canal stenosis. So when we say canal stenosis, it is not always necessary that it is the disc. Canal stenosis, the most common causes are the DLD facets or the flavum. Understood? So don't just look at the disc. We have to see other sources yes. of the stenosis. We have to address them all together. Okay. Malignancies, what kind of malignancy it is? Whether it is osteolytic, it's osteoblastic, or a big kind of malignancy. <clears throat> Basically, we are talking to metastasis. Here, why, why it is important for us? Because when we do vertebrasties, vertical augmentation procedures, we do it for the for the pain relief, right? So we have to identify them, and accordingly we can set our vertebrasty procedure. Now, cyst. What kind of cyst it is, whether it is a facetal cyst coming from the facet joint, whether it is an arachnoid cyst, whether it is a disc, discal cyst. Okay, because the treatment modality will change with, with the kind of cyst. And infections, as I mentioned, even if your diagnosis, you are confirmed about the diagnosis, if you are confirmed about the radiculopathies, if you are confirmed about the sacroiliteus, before doing any intervention, we must go for MRI to rule out any infective cause. Okay. Now we'll see how to read the MRI. <clears throat> There's something called the sequences of the MRI. Have you heard about this T1, T2 images? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So you know about the basics of the MRI? T1, T2, what is T1, what is T2? Okay, I'll tell you about this in briefly. So basically, you have to see three components. With that, we can make out whether it is T1 or T2 and what is the significance of that. Now look at this water. Water content. Water content means anywhere hydration. The fat content. And bones, muscles, ligaments. These All these comes into this category. Okay, now how they will look on the T1 images and how they will look on the T2 images. Okay, so water will look hypo. Hypo means hypo means less dense, dark. Let's say in a in a simple language, hypo means dark. Oh. Okay, hyper means white. Okay. Hyper intense or hypo intense. Hypo intense, we call we can make all it is dark, and hyper intense means it looks white. Right. Okay. So if you look at here, water content, wherever there is a water content, wherever there is a water content, it will look dark on T1 and white on T2. Yeah. Simple. The fat will look white on both T1 and T2. Whereas bones, ligaments, muscles, they will look dark on both T1 and T2. So what is the only difference here? T2 water appears like water. Yes. Only the water content. Right? There is a water content which is a, there is a difference over here. Okay. Now, if you look at this MRI, 
these are circle sections you can see here let's go from posterior to interior so what is that the skin over here Followed by the subcutaneous okay. fat. Okay. Hypo. Hypo. Both are hypo here. Both are hypo here. Okay. Under that skin, we have the subcutaneous fat. Hyper. 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 Hyper on both because fat is white on both. Skin, muscles, bones, ligaments, they are dark on both. So it is. You want to so. Now, if you go anteriorly, more anteriorly, we can see the bone over here. These are what? Spinous process. And in between spinous process, we have interspinous ligaments. Okay. So bone, ligaments, muscles, all they will look dark on both. T1, T2. So here you can see this dark on T1, T2 both. Understood? Now if you go anteriorly over here, can you see this more darker image over here? Can you make out here? Yes, yes. And also, this is even darker in this also, yeah. on P2 also. Yes. This is your? Pedural. This, is, this is your ligamentum flavum. Okay. This is ligamentum flavum. Ligamentum flavum is denser than other ligaments. That's why it is as compared to other ligaments, this is slightly darker, right? So this is your ligament of flavum, which is dark on both T1 and T2. Now we go anterior to that, you can see there's a white portion over here. What is that? So the perineal fat, fat around it. What space is this? Epidural space. Epidural space this is epidural space and white is white in both. Uh, fat content. Yes. Fat. There is a epidural fat. This space is filled with fat. Epidural fats. So that's why this is white on both. Okay. Now you go to the spinal canal and you can see some darker line over here. Yeah. That's the spinal cord in the nerve roots, which is dark here also. CSF. No, the darker part portion. Yeah, spinal yeah. cord. Spinal cord and the nerve spinal root. cord. And the nerve roots. They're darker on both. Yes. The CSF surrounding CSF is dark here and white here. Okay. Because water is dark on T1 and white on T2. So if you have the images in front of you, the first thing what you'll see is the CSF. Just looking at the CSF, you can say that this is T1 and this is T2. Okay? Understood? Now look yes. at the bones. Look at the bones. They are darker on both. The disc, dark on both. Okay. Now if you look at these vertebral bodies and if you look at this vertebral body. Is there a difference? Yeah. Is there any difference here? This is looking slightly whiter, no? Yes. Yes. And it's white on both. Yes. Yeah. So this could be T1 and T2. Huh? Yeah. This could be fatty, fatty infiltration. Yes. Yeah. This could be fatty infiltration. Yeah. Okay. The fatty infiltration may happen after any any injury. Maybe after any infection, or maybe just a normal finding, just a fatty infiltration. Okay. So this will also there is another condition. Yes, will... because, sir, uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. So this uh, T two yeah. uh, that uh, more whiter uh, 
uh, vertebra Mm. It's because of the what increased water and the because of the fatty infiltration, right? No, because that is only hyper because both are hyper. Fat is hyper in both. Yes, uh, is... but because of uh, it's more hyper. Is it because of the more water content there? No, no, it's because of fat only. Okay, it's because of the fat. Both are white. Okay. Okay. Now, if you if you what you are saying is that maybe there's some ongoing pathology inside. Yes. Some ongoing. Went. Ongoing some infection over there. No. Or maybe about. Okay. And you want to rule out whether there's some, some still some there's some infection inside, or if you want to rule out that there is a hemangioma over there. Okay. Hemangioma will also look white on that. Yes. Okay. So. When you have such suspicion, mm -hmm. now what is required? Now you want to see the pathology. There is some pathology. Right? Well, we don't know whether it's a pathology <coughs> or it's just a fat infiltration. <clears throat> so in such case, we have to go for the fat suppression images. Okay. Now what is the meaning of fat suppression images? These are called stir images or fat suppression images. As the name suggests, wherever there is a fat, we want to take those sequences where we can suppress the fat so that we can see other pathologies which may be there hidden inside the white portions. Okay, now look at this image. So this was white here. This was white here. And this has become dark now. Mm. Why it has become dark? There's some light slices. Because there was a this was a fat over here. Yeah. Okay. So that's why when you suppress the fat, it becomes the vertical body becomes dark. Not just vertical body, wherever there's a fat accumulation over there, everything will go dark. Look at this. Look at this here. White, white, and fat has suppressed. <laughs> Look at a little space. The fat was there, now it is dark over here. Okay. So so with this, we can make out that there is no pathology over here. It's a, just a fatty infiltration which has got suppressed. Now suppose there is some ongoing pathology there is, is there inside. Okay, for that, which sequence is important? Fat suppression and contrast enhancement. Contrast enhance. In that case, what will happen? If there is any uh, edema or increased vascularity, yeah. the, the yeah. it starts enhancing it wherever yeah. there is a pathology. Yes. So suppose. There's a pathology inside, there's a, some inf still infections going on inside, or maybe there's some tumor inside, which is an active tumor inside. What will happen to this? Rest everywhere, wherever the fat is there, it can get suppressed, but the pathological part will become more brighter. So with that, we can make out, yes, the pathology is there, still active pathology is there, though it is getting, sub getting healed by the fatty infiltration, but still some pathology is still there. So, whenever you are treating a patient with a pot spine, in a pot spine patient, when you order the MRI for the follow-up, you must request for the contrast enhanced MRI. Fat suppressed contrast enhanced MRI. Because with the treatment, it will start healing with the fatty infiltration. With fatty infiltration, you may not be able to detect the pathologies. So in the follow-up cases of your um, pot spine, you should always order contrast enhanced fat suppress MRIs. Uh, so what does STIR stand for? These are star images. I don't know exactly what is the meaning of that, but this is basically fat suppression images. Okay. Okay. The full form, I don't know. Just can search it. These are fat suppress images. <clears throat> Now, 
Now, tell me about these two. What are these T1 or T2? This T1 or T2? First one is T2, sir. First one. First one is T1. First one is T2 and this one? First one is T2. The mm -hmm. second one is T2. Third one is T1. So everybody is saying that first one is T2? Yes. No, sir. So the CSF will be T2. White will be in T2. T1. But here I don't see that. What is first this? one is T1. Yes, sir. Final chord. The first one is? T1. T1, sir, yeah. because there's no whitish. Uh, the CSF fine. is always yeah. white on T2. But I think looking at this, yes, sir. Looking at this, you thought that it is a T2 image, right? Yes, sir. Not, uh, CSF, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is it possible that one part of the spine has a CSF which is white on T1 and one part is having T1 no. as a dark? Is it no. possible? That is not possible, right? No. But this looks like a CSF over here, right? Yeah. Now, if you look at this T1 now, compare with the T1 now, T2. Yeah. Now, whatever is dark over here so it has become white. white. <laughs> the, the white portion here is still white here. I don't know. Contrast. Hmm? Yes. So what is that now? It's not a fat, 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 epidural fat. No, not the epidural fat. Okay. Epidural fat is here. Contrast. No, not contrast. This is actually the lipoma. Okay. That's a lipoma. Okay. And this lipoma, how we can say this lipoma? Now look at the third image. This is fat suppression image. Fat suppressed, yeah. Now look at this fat suppressed image. This has become dark here. Whatever the white it was here on T1, T2, it has become dark because we have suppressed the fat. Okay. <clears throat> Understood? Yes. Sir. Now this lipoma yeah. is the source of the pain or source of the deficits because this lipoma is suppressing the nerve roots over there. Okay, understood? Sir, on every MRI we ask for, we always get still images. No. And we have to always see. ask for... No, we don't have to ask for this. Yeah. But, but you have to be careful about the centers where you are sending. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, we do a lot of spine cases. I'm a mm -hmm. neuroanesthetist. But mm -hmm. most of the time when we ask for MRI, we have hysteria images in all the films. Yeah, so it's like by default it comes or uh, it's like institutional protocol? It's an institutional protocol. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Those who are practicing outside, whenever mm -hmm. you send an MRI, um, when you send a patient for an MRI, you must select your MRI centers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because what happens, practical, what I'm telling you is a practical thing. Most of the places, radiological centers, they they have this radiologist who may be doing the te tele radiology, hmm. tele reporting. Yeah. Okay. And when the patient goes to the MRI center, they have fixed protocols. They have fixed protocols. They have the technicians who are deciding the protocol. Any patient goes to the MRI, LS spine, they will go for T1, T2, they will get a fixed sections and they will send patient to you. This is a practical problem which happens most of the time. Hmm. The radi radiologist will give the report maybe next day or some maybe after 12 hours or whatever, just based on the films which are, which are taken by the technician. Hmm. Okay. But if a good center, in a good center, where the radiologist is sitting there and is screening and then he is proceeding with the MRIs, they are the person who will, who will see the pathologies are there and then they will decide whether they need a fat suppression, whether they need some other sections or not. 
Understood? Yes. So you have to be careful about where you are sending the patients. If your centers, if your radio centers are manned by the technicians and radiologists are doing tele-reporting, you may face these kind of issues that the sections are not taken properly, the sequences are not taken properly. Okay. So this is this is not mandatory that every patient would need a star images. That is not required, but it all depends on the radiologist who is sitting there. But if you are sending to patients to your patient to some, some such center where they don't take the star images, they don't take the proper sections of the sequences, mm -hmm. in that case, you will mm -hmm. have to mention about that you need a star images of this patient. Okay, all right. Yes. So there is one other condition where we see this whiteness within the vertical bodies, right? And what is that? Hemangioma. Mm -hmm. Hemangiomas. If it is a fat, it will get suppressed. Hemangiomas are again, there are two types. One is that they may get fatty infiltration, which may get suppressed. Or some are active ones, which may not get suppressed. Okay. In that case, after even after stir images, they will look white on MRI. Understood? If you still have confusion, whether it is a hemangioma, or it's a fatty infiltration, if you look closely, if you look closely, you can see some linings over here. Can you see that? Yes. So what are these linings? These are the linings which shows that it's not a, it's a hemangioma and not a fatty, fatty infiltration. Fatty infiltration will be like a diffuse white. Okay. With this, we can make out that it's a hemangioma and not a fatty infiltration. Okay. Why it is important for us? Because <clears throat> hemangiomas, most of the time, they are not painful. But if they are painful, they are a good indication for your whatever plastic procedures. They are one of the commonest, not a commonest, but one of the major indication for, in fact, hemangioma was the, was the first indication for vertebroplasty. When vertebroplasty came, it came for the hemangioma only. Rest all osteopathic fractures, metastatic property fractures, these indications came later. Okay. So this is why it is important for us to understand whether it is a hemangioma or it's a fatty infiltration. Now look at this. What is this? Is it a fatty infiltration or hemangioma? Again, you can see there's a, there are some linings over here. It's a hemangioma, right? Now this hemangioma, this hemangioma, I can say that if it is painful, it's a perfect indication for vertebral vertebroplasty. Whereas this hemangioma is a contraindication for the vertebroplasty. Why so? The second one, the posterior cortex has been bridged. So the cement can leak out and go into the canal. There is no breach over here. Even there is one. Yes, you are right. What you are saying is correct. There is no breach, but yes, posterior cortex is important. Yes. That is very true. You can see here. Can you see something here? Concavity is there. Yeah, you still see the bone. Concavities, they have concavities. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Whereas here you can see there is a convexity. Oh, it's compressing there. No, no, no. Even if it is not compressing. Even if it is not compressing the nerves, it is a contradiction, absolute contradiction for vertebroplasty. Why? Because this is an inactive human juma, whereas this is a active human juma where we have a 
vessel which is supplying this hemangioma, a feeder artery is there which is supplying this hemangioma. And why we are saying this? Because of the erosion of the posterior cortical wall. The posterior cortical wall, there is so much of high pressure over here that it is eroding the posterior cortical wall and it has taken the shape of concavity to convexity. Is that point clear? Yeah. So, who is going to tell you this? Are the reader is going to tell you this? No. You I have should... to see this. You have to see this. Yeah, because now you have a patient who is having hemangioma. They have mentioned in the report that there is a hemangioma covering the entire vertebral body. L1, L2, whatever it is. Okay. Now you have to take a decision whether I should go for the vertebrae in this patient or not. So if you see such kind of hemangioma where the it's bulging like this, even if there is no compression <clears throat> on the nerves, <clears throat> this is becomes a absolute contradiction because if you enter into this kind of hemangioma, the patient will start bleeding. You may not be able to control that bleeding also. Okay. So that is why it is important for us to read the MRIs. <clears throat> Now, if you look at this, <clears throat> these two MRIs, can you see here? <clears throat> T1, T2, right? <clears throat> no doubt here. <clears throat> T1, T2? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One thing I forgot to mention here. <clears throat> okay. Here. Look at the disc here. Can you see some darkness inside? Yes. And if you look at this <clears throat> disc, <clears throat> can you make out a difference between this disc and this disc? Yes. <clears throat> so what is the difference? Water content of this. Perfect. Very good. So this one is looking dark, but this is looking white because the nucleus pulposus is very well hydrated. Nucleus pulposus is like a jelly material which is very well hydrated. It has a lot of water content. That is why the healthy disc on T2, it will look white inside. The end plates, because it's a cartilage, the annulus is dense, although it also has water content, but it is quite dense. That's why it looks dark. But the nucleus purpose is like a jelly material and it looks white. Okay. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now if you look at this one, compare this one this with this. Can you make out some difference here? Yes. This is having less water content. This is having less water content because of the degenerative process which has started taking place in this, in these discs. Because of this degeneration, they are losing the water content. That's why they are becoming darker. They will look same here. They look same here. Understood now? Clear? <clears throat> now look at this. Can you make out the difference here? Yes. Clear? No doubt? Yes. Healthy disc? Healthy disc? Water content? Water content? Look at this disc. What is the difference? No, this is dehydrated, less water content. So, on the left side also, T1, it is dark. On T2, it is again dark. Okay? So, both are dark. Now, look at the vertebral body here. Look at the vertebral body here. Can you see some white, white here? Yes. Hmm? Yes. What is that? So, this is calcification. No, calcification will look dark on even T2 both. Fats, okay. fatty infiltration. This is fat, yes. 
this fat, but this is a normal variation. This is not a fatty infiltration. It's a marrow fat. So marrow is having fat. The bone marrow is fatty. So that's why it will look white, white over here, both. How do we differentiate, sir? It's a normal marrow fat or in? Yes. Whether it is a marrow fat or sort of infiltration. So marrow fat will be, it will be like a normally in all the vertical bodies, you'll see that marrow fat. Okay. okay. In all the vertical bodies, in the center, you will see such kind of fatty portions over there. So this we can make out only in the sagittal section. No, in the in the in the axial cut, it's in supposed it's not some places it might not seen. See, axial sections we cannot see because most of the time axial sections we take from the disc uh, surrounding areas only. Yeah. We don't take the sections from the vertical bodies until unless there is a pathology inside the vertical body, then only they will take a sections from the vertical body. Otherwise, we don't take. Right? That's why you in most of the MRIs you don't see that. Okay. Now, if you look at this, there's something different from this marrow, no? Yes. This is all in white, but here it is. Dark. See this? Dark, white. So, what is that? Is it fat? Fat will look uh, dark on both. No, white on both. White on both, yeah. yeah. White on both. But there's changing here. Yes. So it has to be... Sclerosis. sclerosis, as I mentioned, sclerosis again. Calcification, sclerosis, all will be dark on both. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. Dark on T1 and white on T2. Which means it's a water. water content. Yeah. Why there's a water content? Because there's a this called edema. Mm -hmm. That's a bony edema. Okay, this is bony edema. So this is not a fatty infiltration or the fatty marrow. It's a bony edema. Okay, understood. Sir, in the first image, hmm. uh, if you see the the down arrow, uh, the disc there here, no, it's not like that the normal disc with the pulposes being white on the peripheries. It looks like fragmented. Which one? This one? Uh, yeah, yes, exactly where you're showing. Here. Uh, is uh -huh. it like sequestered disc? Or is it something like that? No, no, it's a deviation of the disc. So sequestration is basically the herniation. It's a variation of the herniation. Okay. Okay. Here it is. We can we, we already make out here over here that mm -hmm. it is dark over here, it is dark over here. That mm -hmm. means we know that there's a degeneration process which is already taking place over here in the disc. Okay. And these are the changes which are happening. That is what I mentioned in the first okay. slide of the MRI. These are called the modic changes or the secondary changes. Mm -hmm. Because of this, because of the disc degeneration, the surrounding end plates. Okay, they undergo some secondary changes. Because when the disc degenerates, they start cracking, they start cracking and that may cause some micro fractures in, in the end plates. And these micro fractures will initiate the inflammatory process. And that will lead to the edema. So with this, we can make out, yes, there's some pathology which is going on. It's a lot of inflammation over here. So okay. these are the patients who will come to you with a lot of with lot of stiffness in the lower back. Okay. Understood now? Is it clear? Oh, yes. This is like, you can see, this is totally white over here. This is a typical feature of the post-radiation. Post-radiation, after radiation, the vertical bodies undergo severe fatty condition, fatty suppressments, and that will look like this bright white on T1 and T2 images. Look at this. 
lot of fatty infiltration over here. This is a typical feature in the severe osteoporotic spine. Severe osteoporotic spine. We will see such kind of fatty infiltrations. Now, if you look at this one, which is a fractured one, which is a compressed one. Now, in this, what is there is some, some change in this. If you look at this part, which is white on T2, but it is dark on T1, which means it's an acute trauma or acute fracture. That's why there is a lot of edema over here. So this is edema. Okay. So this is an active fracture or acute fracture. Is this clear? Now this is important for us. When we when we treat the osteoporotic spine, when we do vertebral pasties, when we when we are dealing with the osteoporotic fractures, we have to see this edema. If we have the edema present, the fracture may be three months old, six months old, one year old. But if the buddhil body is still having edema, that means the fracture is not healed. And that becomes an indication even after six months or one year also. Okay. But if you see that, if suppose if it is white, completely white like this, all of the vertebras, if it is completely white like this, and this also white over here like this, that means the healing has already taken place. It is already replaced by the fatty tissues. So that becomes a that become that is a not an indication for vertebral augmentation. Is this point clear? Am I clear on this point? Yes. Okay. Because we we have to decide whether we can go. We can see the fracture, right? You can see the fracture there. There is a compression. But yes. whether this compression is an indication for a vertebrasty or not, how will you decide? Whether it is active or not? Whether it is healed or not? How will you make out that? By comparing the T1 and T2 images. If it is dark on T1 and white on T2, that means it is still active fracture. If it is white on T1, T2, it is already replaced with the fatty infiltration. If it is dark on T1 and T2, that means it is already healed completely with the sclerosis. Okay. Then it is not an indication for vertebrosity. Okay. Understood? <clears throat> Look at this MRI. Look at the X-ray of this patient. X-ray looks normal, right? It looks normal. But the same patient is having MRI and you can see multiple pathologies over here. Multiple entry changes are happening in the entire spine. Okay? So what are these changes? Now if you look at, compare here, can you see something here? What is this? This is white. Yeah. White. This again white. Yeah. Hmm? What yeah. is that? What is that? This is water content. No, it's a fat. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So end trade defect was there. End trade changes were there. So getting healed with the fatty yeah. infiltration. Now if you go up over here, you can see some white over here. And dark over here. So this is your T1 and this is your T2 now. This is T2. So dark over here and white over here, that means edema. Edema. So that means the entering spondylitis is started from the lower side and it is progressing upwards. Now this point this area is getting healed with fatty infiltration, and this area is getting affected with the Fresh inflammatory changes. Okay. Whatever has sclerosed, 
if whatever has sclerosed, already sclerosed, that will look dark yeah. on T1 and T2 images. Okay? Understood? Clear? Yeah. So, till the time it is not sclerosed, till the time it is not fused, we may not see anything on the X-rays. The sclerosis will look, how much, how, how will it look on X-ray? More white. Yes, white. bright white. On CT scan, it will look bright white. On MRI, it will be totally dark. Okay? Till the stage of the fatty infiltration, we may not be able to appreciate anything on the X-rays. Okay. <clears throat> so this is about the sections of the MRI. Now we'll go to the sequences of the, sorry, uh, sequences we covered. Now we'll go for the sections of the MRI. Okay. Just give me seven minutes. Can I take seven minutes break? Yes. Yeah, please. Please. Yeah, yeah. Shut up. 